I hope everyone can see this. Um, okay. So it's a pleasure to be here and uh, certainly back in Denver after 11 years at Duke. Um, I've got a, a 10 minute uh, short task here of uh, going through the evaluation of the painful elbow, which is my charge uh, this morning. I don't have any pertinent uh, disclosures except for the photographs some of you see uh, part of a, uh, a book project that we were part of. But I do have the disclosure of uh, having uh, been here in Denver and seeing the excitement of sports and getting back to sports. And this is a 24 year old running back following a complex left elbow fracture repair. And the question is, did he make it across the goal line with enough elbow extension? And we all recognize the elbow as being a tremendously complex joint. It doesn't like stiffness. And so injuries uh, are really critical for, the, for uh, being able to identify and to evaluate effectively. I'm gonna start here though, because I do have an interest in nerve. And for anyone uh, that you can raise your hand or select A, B, C, or D, um, this is a rugby player with a first rib pseudarthrosis. And uh, the dysesthesias uh, are to which distribution? And you say, well, why is this a part of our elbow discussion? Well, I think it's really critical to recognize pertinent anatomy, not just at the elbow, but what may cause symptoms around the elbow when we're doing our thorough evaluation. And that includes nerve distributions as well. But most of our elbow patients come from these types of activities, uh, sports, uh, complex uh, injuries come with complex uh, interactions with our environment. Um, and so it's important that we get a good history. We understand the sport or the activity and the injury mechanism uh, is a part of it because sometimes things are so complex that it's actually hard to, to figure out the injury mechanism. So I think we appreciate. Anatomy is really the key to the clinical assessment of the elbow and really critically understanding not just the outside, but with our sort of x-ray vision where we put our index finger for palpation, what we appreciate in terms of joint effusion, the location of our uh, primary complaints are really critical to our assessment and it helps us to guide effectively our diagnostic workup. That includes imaging and testing and so forth. And effectively, as we look at sort of the general principles, we really sort of break down the elbow pathology in terms of intra-articular versus extra-articular pathology. And then obviously whether the problem is local or regional and or whether it's a referred symptom, something coming from afar. Our symptoms are is really a part of our uh, patient workup. And I think we all recognize that our patients really tell us their diagnosis if we listen carefully and if we ask the right questions. So if th this we're talking about the lateral elbow, the onset of symptoms, are they abrupt? Are they gradual? Are there certain things that aggravate the condition? The classic elbow, extending the elbow, palm down, lifting something from the floor is perhaps much more clinically applicable to the lateral epicondyle. If we're thinking about the quality of symptoms, getting a sense as to whether this is sharp and localized, whether this is an aching sensation or burning, which may be nerve related, um, or catching. For example, somebody with a, a osteochondral loose body, which may be causing a locking or a catching sensation in the mid arc of motion, as opposed to somebody with terminal extension or terminal flexion stiffness. The location is really critical and really having the patients describe where their symptoms are, I think as all of us recognize, the more vague, probably the more less reliable our, our, our ability to localize a symptom to a tendon or a ligament origin. And perhaps we have to think of a muscular tendinous unit, a joint, or perhaps even a, a nerve related symptoms. Chronicity is also important, not just for the timing of onset, but also what's happened in the past in terms of the response to treatment. Did they get better for a period of time after an injection or a certain modality of treatment? And then critically, the associated findings. Are there, is there neck pain associated with their worsening of their symptoms? Do their symptoms radiate into the forearm, et cetera? And I think this is really critical to ask these key questions. We're all familiar with walking through the basics of a clinical examination, but so I won't spend a lot of time going through the basics but there are nuances to each of these uh, on the list here, and we'll sort of attach these. Clinical examination, oftentimes with the elbow, it, it may be limited in terms of the range of motion, really getting a sense as to pronosupination, flexion extension, which can certainly be affected by the joints above and below. The, the DRUJ is just as important as the PRUJ in, in forearm pronosupination, 
And the shoulder oftentimes can give us a sense of limited elbow motion as well. Differential diagnosis is a part of our clinical exam and a good vascular exam, for example, may pick up somebody who's got a cervical rib or an abnormality in their cervical spine that lends itself to a vascular compression that actually creates symptoms downstream in terms of fatigue or relative sense of activity and tolerance. And no different than the patient with a cervical spine, C5, C6 related cervical radiculopathy that may be a source of elbow symptoms in terms of lateral elbow pain. And these are those patients that have a really exquisite tenderness along the radial nerve distribution, usually asymmetric from the contralateral side, but not always. So the, having this as a part of our question and answer, but also in terms of our hands-on assessment. Functional assessments are often important for our sporting athletes, um, whether this is by a trainer, whether this is by our occupational therapist, but to really critically assess the patient's activity. Are they actually following through appropriately? Are they making contact with the ball at appropriate uh, level for tennis players, for example? This can come sometimes from a coach that's letting us know their, their examination just as importantly as their functional assessment. And these are tools that are in our toolbox to really engage in sort of a multimodality assessment. So the clinical examination really goes back to our pertinent anatomy. Remember the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the primary stabilizer of the lateral elbow uh, resisting varus stress, but the actual lateral collateral ligament complex is really this sort of sheet, if you would. Um, and these are the structures that we have to rely on in terms of both repair, but also appreciating instability, such as with posterolateral rotational instability of the elbow. And even a patient who's undergone multiple steroid injections for lateral epicondylitis can put these structures at risk. So being aware of putting your fingers on this uh, structure and being aware of their, of their location will help us in terms of our clinical examination, including for the more superficial structures. And you can see here at the lateral elbow that the lateral um, extensor and supinator origin, along with our mobile wad, is a part of our diagnostic workup. But when you actually take it apart, so to speak, we can appreciate the lateral epicondylitis patient with the more tendinous origin of the lateral epicondyl epicondylar region is the ECRB as opposed to number two there, which is the more muscular origin of our ECRL. Close by to the lateral elbow, just a few finger breaths distally is our radial nerve and the PIN as it uh, heads into the radial tunnel region. This is obviously important surgical anatomy, but it's critical in terms of our ability to, to pick up on our diagnostic workup. And this is the PIN heading along the dorsal forearm where our, our clinical findings are also gonna be suggestive of pain that radiates in the same region as our PIN. So inspection of the, the lateral elbow, you might see a patient with instability um, and obviously this sort of skin puckering uh, may be associated with these same uh, x-ray findings where you actually have a, the inspection itself will give us our uh, an key or an indicator as to our diagnosis. Palpation is critical. And again, being specific, this is the lateral epicondyle. And yet there are patients with lateral epicondylitis that also have pain further down the radial tunnel. And we have to recognize this may in, imply some difference or some combination of of onset of symptoms in terms of etiology of elbow pain. So differentiating between these relative locations of the lateral epicondyle versus the radial tunnel can be important for our testing. And similarly, identifying the location of pain with provocative maneuvers, such as a resisted two finger extension test and really focused on, on the lateral epicondyle. I also find very commonly patients treated for lateral epicondylitis that actually come in with this vague sense of symptoms really between if you took the mobile wad in your own hand, four or five centimeters distal to the lateral epicondyle, and they complain of more vague pain than localized symptoms to the lateral epicondyle. And this remember is down deep to your mobile wad is actually the location of your biceps insertion. And so patients with distal biceps tendinopathy or even a strain of their biceps can complain of pain along the lateral margin of their elbow but a careful examination will also reveal pain at the insertion of the biceps. Obviously a hook test allows us to look more critically at the integrity of the biceps tendon. And obviously if we are concerned about the integrity, we can go on to further image their biceps. 
Injection history can also be a part of your clinical examination. How did a patient do after a previous uh, injection? And where was the injection placed? Was it an intraarticular injection? Was it a soft tissue injection around the elbow? And then don't forget that patients with a history of injections may also suffer from the consequences of previous injection and multiple corticosteroid injections, as we all know, can lead to de degradation of our collateral ligament origin and in elbow instability, as well as integrity loss of our capsular tissues and even fistula formation from our synovium of our elbow joint. A diagnostic injection, however, can be a very strong diagnostic tool. And I use this very frequently when we're trying to figure out if is this an intra versus an extra articular uh, condition. And the diagnostic injection can be very helpful from that perspective. When we look at the elbow uh, imaging, our elbow imaging in terms of radiographs can help us with intra-articular pathology. It, uh, advanced imaging can obviously differentiate between collateral ligament versus extensor origin conditions. And imaging itself can, can point out acute versus chronic. And don't even forget the patient with a congenital radial head dislocation that once in a while can, can manifest itself with elbow pain. We also can see pertinent history in terms of previous injury, although it's not so good at pointing out chondral injuries, which may be the sequelae of previous injuries. And obviously, as we are investigating further, use of stress views or fluoroscopy can be very helpful in terms of dynamic imaging for subtle instabilities or perhaps not so subtle instabilities. For advanced imaging for collateral ligament injuries, uh, MR arthrograms are usually very, very helpful. They are the most sensitive and specific testing for our elbow collateral ligament injuries, both on the lateral and ulnar collateral ligament sides. The distal biceps, as I mentioned, can be a source of pathology, whether a complete rupture or don't forget the partial rupture leading to chronic pain associated with tendinosis or partial ruptures. And these are subtle findings sometimes in terms of even diagnostic forearm pronation and supination, which the patient describes as sometimes catching or associated with chronic tendinopathies and essential uh, bicepital uh, tuberosity bulk from the tendinopathy itself. And these you might find on radiographs uh, or on uh, MRI findings. And then distal triceps pathology, uh, uh, obviously a, a palpable defect at the triceps insertion and limited findings oftentimes radiographically, but you may see a subtle avulsion injury like you see here, or obviously MRI can be helpful for uh, tendinosis related changes or degenerative processes associated with triceps pathology. And then finally on the medial elbow, patients undergoing uh, uh, sports where they put themselves at the, their own risk and perhaps this, this ball came out, but sometimes it may lead a patient with a, a not so happy outcome uh, with medial elbow flexor pronator strain or even an MCL injury that you can see here. The, the key is understanding the, the relative contributions to stabilization at the elbow. Don't forget also the medial elbow, uh, we see the median nerve here and the median nerve pathology in terms of local uh, uh, soft tissue compression from our Lacertus, our pronator, and even uh, the pronator being two heads, the superficial and deep heads can lead to pronation or to the pronator syndrome, or even more distally, the FDS origin can sometimes be a source of median nerve pain. Again, these are all parts of our clinical history, sometimes with median nerve disturbance distally, but also in part uh, it can be picked up on clinical examination when you can differentiate provocative maneuvers for each of these three locations. And then finally, the medial elbow is also a source of uh, ulnar nerve symptoms at the elbow. This is the medial epicondyle, or two heads of the FCU, and our ulnar nerve. And this is sometimes a source of symptoms if we have a patient who has very subtle ulnar nerve instability at the elbow. You can see here coming up in just a moment, the very subtle ulnar nerve instability right there. And this is what happens in this patient with the ulnar nerve instability, you can see the irritation of the ulnar nerve creates this uh, not so happy FCU tendon. Don't be fooled at the ulnar nerve with this snapping triceps. And this is a, a diagnosis of, of careful examination for ulnar nerve irritability. And you can see the, ulnar, the triceps tendon here subluxing. This is well picked up on ultrasound as uh, pointed out by Bob, uh, Rob Spinner, the Mayo Clinic and one of my previous partners, Richard Goldner. And this is uh, treated effectively with recession of the triceps and repositioning. 
And then finally, this is a great case just for careful exploration or careful examination of a patient and history taking. This is a patient who saw some top sports folks around uh, the region who came in for a fourth opinion after multiple tests, multiple diagnoses. The key here was listening to the patient's history of where his pain was. Um, he had both elbow pain with the caulking phase, but also following follow through, he also had significant forearm pain and cramping, particularly after repetitious throwing. And Gary Lurie pointed out this uh, uh, interesting diagnosis of the, the Ancaneus epitrochlearis, which I, I think everyone recognizes here at the medial elbow. Um, this is the Ancaneus epitrochlearis. It can be a source of uh, ulnar nerve compression and has been highlighted in young throwing athletes in particular. And this is his case. This is actually releasing. You can see the Ancaneus epitrochlearis being quite a substantial structure here. And once we've released the Ancaneus Ancaneus epitrochlearis. This is intraoperative. Look at his forearm and the fasciculations of the forearm musculature, sort of the ulnar nerve breathing a sigh of relief. And then finally, elbow instability, uh, pivot shift tests. This is really uh, finding the, the, the subtle instabilities is, is really critical. And sometimes we even have to take these patients and have them under a block or under general anesthesia to relax their, their, uh, their resistance in the terms of their muscle. They usually tell us a story where they don't like to push off, such as a chair raise test, and they really don't like to, to undergo some of these stress tests, uh, stress tests with the, the uh, forearm, applying a valgus force while uh, flexing the elbow, and the joint actually reduces at 70 to 110 degrees for this subtle posterolateral rotational instability. And so this is often a, a test that's done sometimes under a block or under a, a regional or general anesthesia. And then finally, the MCL with we recognize the valgus stress test, milking maneuver, and a valgus extension overload in a repetitive throwing athlete with some sometimes uh, postromedial joint line pain at the ulnohumeral joint, sometimes even with some degenerative changes or early osteophyte formation can be seen uh, aggravated with resisted elbow extension. So I know I've gone a little bit over time. Sorry, Eric. Um, but in summary, a comprehensive history is critical. Be aware of key anatomic uh, diagnostic. Your finger is really the important point of your being precise with where the patient's symptoms are located. Diagnostic injections and provocative maneuvers can be extremely helpful. And then don't forget to select your imaging correctly. Adding a, an arthrogram to an MRI can increase your sensitivity and your specificity for critical injuries. And then don't forget about distant etiology for your elbow symptoms. Um, if your exam, uh, it doesn't show any signs of uh, local elbow pathology. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the rest of the talks.